Luke Vargas is a political correspondent for Talk Radio News Service. He was at the second presidential debate yesterday at Hofstra University. He joins us today from uh, in a very Matrix-like Agent Smith look from from a, the, a rooftop in Brooklyn, incredibly. So, Luke, let's talk first about the perceptions of the debate. We have Insta polls. We had a ton of social media activity. And then after the fact, people can watch it on the Internet. They'll also read summaries in newspapers. Do we have kind of a two uh, a two sided uh, two different groups in terms of how these debates are consumed developing and how will opinions vary based on that I, I couldn't help but feel that as I sat inside the media filing center which was uh, filled with about 400 journalists uh, so many of them pretty much exclusively on their tweet decks and, and just sort of sending out instantaneous commentary on the debate. I felt like we were having a 1960 moment again. For anyone who's a political junkie, this is when Nixon debated Kennedy. Of those people who were watching on television uh, overwhelmingly thought that Kennedy won the debate because of his good looks. Nixon carried all those people on the radio. And I, I keep thinking, uh, you know, maybe four, eight, twelve years ago, Mitt Romney could say something like, uh, w when I went out looking for uh, an appointee f <laughs> as governor of Massachusetts, they brought me binders full of women. Maybe that comment would have sort of gone under the radar, but now uh, I saw that room of full of journalists light up. As soon as a comment like that gets dropped in there in our snarky commentary world, people were uh, immediately looking to see who just purchased that domain name, bindersfullofwomen.com. Uh, uh, you know, Romney just said, uh, uh, we want to give women flexibility in the workforce so they can, uh, you know, sort of make dinner at home. <laughs> All those right. things were picked up immediately. And I think if maybe if you were just watching on television at home, then you fall asleep and wake up and pick up a newspaper. You might have thought Romney did a little better, and polls uh, on issue by issue sort of showed that he did better, but the overall winner was still uh, Barack Obama. Okay, so talk about that a little. When some of those funny lines happened yesterday, like for example, the, uh, the binder, he has binders full of women, and then also, you know, women need to be able to, sometimes women want to be able to be home and make dinner, because of course that's what women do. Uh, what else was there? You know, the Libya thing, which I thought was, was Romney's weakest moment, where he really just self-destructed. What was it like? I mean, did, was there immediate realization from the press group that was there that, wow, something interesting just happened? or did it kind of take a while to filter in? Uh, everything was very instantaneous. Actually, the moment where the, the sort of laughter of the press corps uh, reached a peak was uh, when Obama and Romney were talking about their pensions. And Romney s kept saying to Obama, have you looked at your pension? Have you looked at your pension? Uh, for the first few seconds, Obama was looking at the moderator and just smiling. Right. And then you saw a little uh, you know, switch <laughs> click. And uh, Obama looked at Romney and said, uh, w you know, well, yours is a lot bigger than mine. A and that point, the, just the whole media center started laughing. And you realize it's those sort of turning points of the debate which again if, you, if you're in a quiet place just watching on television you're not going to to sense that uh, the entire uh, you know really journalist core of the United States is in a room where everyone's laughing I mean it really does change the way that uh, the people who are writing about these kind of debates uh, talk about the debates in the days after and I think it hurt Romney in that regard let's talk a little bit about uh, Candy Crowley the moderator and in initially within 30 seconds Fox News was criticizing uh, Candy Crowley for saying you know the, the questions were biased and she was ha getting too involved for example when she instant fact-checked Mitt Romney at the same time though some of the moments that I think hurt Romney the most were, were sh when she didn't get involved and let Romney talk directly to President Obama, which were some of the moments Romney really buried himself. So what's the sense about, about Candy Crowley's involvement? Right, it's the old adage that you're going to vote for someone who you'd like to have in your living room for the next four years. And I think it was those times when Candy Crowley sort of let the, let the candidates go at it a little bit more. I'm looking at a transcript here, and this word that keeps popping up is crosstalk in right. parentheses. It's sort of basically that there were so many times during the debate where they were just yelling over each other. Right. And in those points, it sort of forced Romney into taking on a kind of negative, domineering energy that I think people wouldn't want in their living room at all. Uh, sort of more reminiscent, uh, people have said, it's like kind of the boss you don't, you don't want to work for. He took on this kind of, I run this place, uh, l let me try to play by the rules. And Candy Crowley, and if you instances, even had some great quotes where she says, uh, Mr. Romney, that's exa not exactly what the rules are around here. It's not, it's not you know, really structured quite like that. Right. Uh, so, but I, I think it, it sort of pushed him out of the persona that was so evident in that first debate where even though Jim Lair did get pushed around a little bit, he still kept Romney to task and Romney wasn't being, a, I wouldn't say rude necessarily, but he wasn't pushing the limits too much on the debate rules. No, and part and of that was Jim Lair, Jim Lair was so absent from that debate that there was not really even an opportunity to push him around because he was just 
just kind yeah. of like a potted plant there. A very, very different situation here for sure. Last thing I want to touch on, after the debate, I started reading online that in the spin room, it was all Democrats and that the Republicans just were basically missing in action. I can't imagine that that's really the, the case. Was, what's the explanation for why that may have been circulating? Well, it's not really the case. What happened was the debate ran about four minutes overtime, and, and right before uh, the hour of 10.30, uh, which is when the debate was scheduled to end, all the Obama surrogates came out. I'd say there are about uh, maybe you know, 12, 15 of them at, at the very beginning. It wasn't until the debate actually concluded, maybe a full seven, eight minutes later, that the Romney surrogates came out. Ostensibly, they were listening to the final minutes of the debate before coming out with their talking points. So, yes, I'd say maybe up to 10 minutes of time, uh, m m I guess the time when there were the most viewers and people watching the Obama campaign really running the spin room. But before long, all the Romney campaign surrogates came out and uh, they leveled the playing field. All right. Well, that certainly makes, uh, makes more sense. Okay. Luke Vargas, Talk Radio News Service, joining us from a rooftop in Brooklyn today. <laughs> and uh, that, that's, uh, it, it's all happening. Thanks, Luke, as always. Take care.